This is the 21st video in a series devoted to complex analysis. And today we're going to look at the notion of a residue of a function, building up to a nice result in the forthcoming video, the next video, where we relate the residues of a function with the integral over a certain region. Okay, let's start with a couple of definitions. So if f is a function from d, where d is a domain in the complex plane to the complex numbers, and it's analytic except for a set of finitely many poles, then it is said to be meromorphic on d. So as you've probably noticed, we've been looking at functions that are meromorphic on domains for several videos, but we just didn't have a word for it, and now we do. Okay, so now the big definition for today is the following definition. So let's suppose that Z0 is an isolated singularity of F and that F of Z expands as a Laurent series in the punctured disk with radius capital R centered at Z0 like this. So it's the sum as N ranges over all integers of A sub N Z minus Z0 to the N. So in previous video, we showed that you could do this kind of expansion. Then the residue of F at Z0 is defined as the minus first coefficient. So that'll be the coefficient attached to z minus z naught to the negative one or to one over z minus z naught. Furthermore, by an integral formula that we had in previous videos, that's equal to one over two pi i, and then the integral over the circle of radius little r centered at z naught of the function f. And you might say, well, what is this little r? Well, it's any radius that's between zero and capital R. So you're in that region where this thing is analytic. So let's now like jump into examples. And this video is going to be mostly examples of residues of functions, as well as some tricks for calculating residues easily. Okay, so let's first start by looking at the residue of e to the 1 over z at 0. Notice in a previous video we showed that 1 over, or that e to the 1 over z had something called an essential singularity at 0. So an essential singularity was not a pole. So this is not a meromorphic function for what it's worth. But we can still expand e to the 1 over z as a Laurent series in the punctured disk where we pull out the origin. And we do that with the standard formula for the Taylor expansion of e to the x, where we've just set x equal to 1 over z. So I'll just write that down real quick. So this is of the form 1 plus... 1 over z plus 1 over 2z squared plus 1 over 3 factorial z cubed plus dot dot dot. So if you recall, this is generally written as the sum as n goes from 0 to infinity of 1 over n factorial times z to the n using just the standard series expansion of e to the x, like I said. But if we extract the coefficient of z to the minus 1, well, that's just going to be 1. That means our residue here is the number 1. So now let's do another couple, maybe. So let's do the residue of 1 over z minus 1 times z plus 3 at 1. Okay, so let's start by taking this 1 over z minus 1 times z plus 3, and we'll expand it using partial fractions. So I won't work all the details of the expansion with partial fractions because that should be fairly standard kind of calculation. But what we end up with is 1 quarter over z minus 1 plus negative 1 quarter over z plus 3. So that's what we get for those coefficients there. And then the important thing is that this guy right here is analytic at z equals negative 3, whereas this guy right here is analytic at z equals 1. But let's see what that really means. That means if we're expanding about z equals minus 3, this guy right here will look like the sum as n goes from 0 to infinity of a sub n times z plus 3. 
3 to the n. Notice we only have non-negative powers of z. So the Laurent expansion all together at z equals negative 3 will include this term right here and this term right here. Versus if we're doing expansion about negative 1, since this is analytic at negative 1, it expands as the sum as n goes from 0 to infinity of b sub n, z minus 1 to the n. I should have said z equals 1. So likewise, the only thing contributing to negative powers of z minus 1 there will be this term. And so putting the Laurent series together centered at z equals 1, we have this and this. Whereas putting the Laurent series centered at z equals negative 3, we have this orange thing and this orange thing. But that allows us to calculate the residue very, very easily. So the residue at 1 will be 1 quarter because that's the coefficient of z minus 1 to the negative 1. And similarly, the residue of this thing at negative 3 will be equal to negative 1 quarter for the same reason. And this example actually provides us with some motivation for our first trick for calculating residues. So as a bit of a summary of what we saw this last example pointing towards, we have the following kind of general statement which will have this proposition linked to us that gives us a nice calculational formula for finding residues at simple poles. So if we can write f of z as a over z minus z naught plus a function which is analytic at z naught, then that implies that the residue of f at z naught is equal to this capital A. So it's the coefficient of this z minus z naught. And that's because this bit right here that's analytic at z naught does not contribute any negative powers of z minus z naught in the Laurent expansion. And so let's, occur that th let's notice that this occurs when we have a simple pole at z naught, leading us to the following proposition. So if f has a simple pole at z naught, recall that simple means an order one pole, then the residue of f at z naught is equal to the limit as z approaches z naught of z minus z naught times f of z. Okay, so let's see how the proof of this goes. So if f has a simple pole at z naught, then that means that we can write f of z as the sum as n goes from negative 1 to infinity of a sub n times z minus z naught to the n. So recall that a simple pole is an order 1 pole, and an order 1 pole tells us where to start this Laurent series. And I guess I should point out that since this is a simple pole, a sub minus 1 is not equal to 0. If it were equal to 0, this wouldn't be a simple pole. It would be, at worst, a removable singularity. Okay, great. So now let's take this thing and multiply by z minus z naught. So z minus z naught times f of z now looks like the sum as n goes from negative 1 to infinity of a sub n and then z minus z naught to the n plus 1. So now let's pull out the first term, or really the negative first term here. Notice the negative first term here is a sub minus 1, and then we have z minus z naught to the minus 1 plus 1, which is 0. And then after that, we'll have the sum as n goes from 0 to infinity of a sub n, z minus z naught to the n plus 1. But this thing right here has the important property that every term has a z minus z naught as part of it. So we can rewrite this as z minus z naught times g of z. But now if we take the limit of both sides of this, so let's take the limit as z approaches z naught of this side, but if we take the limit as z approaches z naught of this side, then this bit goes to zero because g of z is kind of clearly analytic at z naught by its construction, and we're left with a minus 1. 
which is exactly the residue, which is exactly where we needed to end up. Okay, so let's get rid of this and we're going to look at one more result relating to simple poles. So the last proposition that we looked at was extremely helpful if we have simple poles of rational functions. And this one is helpful if we have simple poles of functions that may not be rational because it gives us some sort of method using calculus or like complex analysis in this case to make a simplification step, whereas we used algebra in the last one to do our simplification. Okay, so let's see what it says. If we've got a function f of z, which is of the form p of z over q of z, where those are just functions, p of z naught is not equal to zero, and q of z has a zero of order one at z naught. So if q of z has a zero of order one at z naught, that means that f of z has a simple pole at z naught, given that p of z naught is not equal to zero. Then we can calculate the residue of f at z naught by taking p of z naught over the derivative of q at z naught. So this gives us a pretty nice way to calculate the residue of a simple pole in these cases. All right, let's see how this goes. So let's look at the residue of f at z naught. And by our previous result, we know that's the limit as z goes to z naught of z minus z naught times p of z all over q of z. But now let's notice that p of z naught is not equal to zero. And furthermore, I guess we're assuming these things are like analytic functions, both of them are. So that means we can bring the limit as z goes to z naught of p of z out. And we can do that and just apply z naught to p of z. So that gives us p of z naught. And then the limit as z goes to z naught of z minus z naught over q of z that? Well, that's just the reciprocal of the derivative of q of z by the definition of the derivative. And that gives us our result. So we have p of z naught over q prime of z naught just as we needed. So now let's look at some examples that apply these two propositions. So for our first example, we're going to do one that can actually be calculated both ways pretty easily. And that'll be finding the residue of z plus 1 over z squared plus 1 at i. Notice that is definitely a pole of order 1 of this function because it's a 0 of order 1 of z squared plus 1. So let's use our first technique first. So that's going to give us the limit as z approaches i of z minus i times z plus 1 over z plus i times z minus i. Given that this z squared plus 1 is like z squared minus i squared, so we can factor it like a difference of squares. But now we can have this simplification. Notice this guy right here will simplify with that guy right there. They'll cancel. That leaves us with something that we can just plug i into. That gives me i plus 1 over i plus i, which is 2i. Then we could simplify that if we wanted to as, let's see, 1 half and then minus i over 2. So 1 half because the i over i cancel and then 1 over i is negative i. So that's how we pick up this minus sign. Okay, good. Now let's do it the other way. So using the other method, this is going to be equal to, let's see, z plus 1 over the derivative of z squared plus 1. So I'll just put z squared plus 1 prime there, evaluated at z equals i. So that gives me z plus 1 over 2z, evaluated at z equals i, taking that derivative. That gives me exactly the same thing. So i plus 1 over 2i, which is equal to half minus i over 2. Now let's look at another example. Let's find the residue of 1 over sine of z at maybe let's say pi. So at z equals pi. Now we could use this first method, but then we'd have to take a limit, which is a little bit trickier than we need to. So we might as well use the second method, which is available because pi is a first order zero of sine of z, making it a first order pole of this whole thing. 
So this is going to be 1 over the derivative of sine of z. So I'll put sine of z prime. Evaluate at z equals pi. That gives me 1 over the cosine of pi when all is said and done. But the cosine of pi is negative 1. Okay, nice. So now let's move on to how we'll deal with second and higher order poles. Now we'd like to generalize one of those formulas that we had for finding residues at first order poles to higher order poles. And we'll do that with a little bit of exploration that will lead us to a proposition that we can write down. So let's suppose first that F has a second order pole at Z naught. Okay, but if it has a second order pole at z naught, that means we can write f of z as a sub minus two over z minus z naught squared plus a sub minus one over z minus z naught plus something that's analytic at z naught. So in the end, just like with all residues, our goal should be to do some sort of operations on this Laurent series so that we extract this coefficient here. So let's write that down, extract this. The careful thing here is that we wanna extract this guy right here without extracting a sub minus two, and in general, without extracting anything in that direction. So let's start by multiplying by z minus z naught squared. That's like motivated by what we saw in our previous proposition. So we have z minus z naught squared times f of z equals, well, that's gonna be a sub minus two plus a sub minus one times z minus z naught plus, I'll call this thing g of z. So this thing that is analytic at z naught, I'll call it g of z. And then furthermore, notice that g of z, now this has a double zero at z naught. I guess I should say that g of z is not exactly this thing. It's this thing times z minus z naught squared. The important thing, and this is pretty important, that this thing has a double zero at z naught. But let's look at this. We want to extract a sub minus 1. So we can't just plug in z equals z naught to both sides, or take the limit, if you will, because that will extract a sub minus 2. So how can we get rid of a minus 2 and only keep a minus 1? We can do that by taking the derivative. So let's take the derivative. So the derivative with respect to z of z minus z naught squared times f of z will be equal to, well, let's see, this is going to go to 0, and then we'll have a sub minus 1 plus g prime of z. But now since g of z had at least a double zero at z naught, I didn't write at least there, but that's kind of in the undercurrent. This at least has a single zero. I'll just write zero at z naught. Because anytime you take the derivative of something with at least a double zero, it has at least a single zero by the definitions and kind of results regarding zeros of analytic functions, which we did a couple videos ago. And now we can take the limit as z approaches z naught of both sides, and you'll see that we extract exactly what we need, because if we plug z naught into this, we get zero. And that leaves us with the limit as z approaches z naught of the derivative of z minus z naught squared times f of z equals a sub minus one, but that's the residue of f at z naught. So that gives us a nice formula for a double pole, which we can generalize to a pole of order n, and we'll do that on the next board. And here's our nice general formula for finding the residue at a pole of arbitrary order, which I'll call capital N. So that residue at z naught, where like I said, z naught is a pole of order capital N, happens to be equal to one over N minus one factorial. Then we have the limit as z approaches z naught of the N minus first derivative of the product of z minus z naught to the N times F of z. Okay, great. So now let's jump into the proof of this. 
So if f of z has a pole of order capital N at z naught, that means we can take f of z and expand it as a Laurent series. The sum as n goes from negative n up to infinity of a sub n z minus z naught to the capital N, or sorry, to the lowercase n, and here a sub minus n is not equal to zero. That's baked into the definition of a pole of order n. Now let's multiply this thing by z minus z naught to the capital N and see what happens. So that's going to give us the sum as n goes from minus n up to infinity of a sub n, and then we'll have z minus z naught to the capital N plus little n. Now I'm going to split this sum into a couple of pieces, or maybe three distinct pieces. So let's first start by taking the sum as little n goes from minus n to minus 2 of a sub n, and then we have z minus z naught to the n plus n. And then we'll have the n equals minus 1 term, so that'll be plus a sub minus 1, and then z minus z naught to the capital N minus 1, and then all of the rest of them. So that'll be plus the sum as n goes from 0 up to infinity of a sub n and then z minus z naught to the capital N plus little n. And then we want to look at some observations of these parts. So let's maybe first look at the observation of this part right here. This happens to be a polynomial. It's a polynomial because it's a finite sum of degree. Let's see, the degree is going to be less than or equal to n minus 2. So it's equal to n minus 2 if the a sub minus 2 term is non-zero. It's less than n minus 2 if the a sub n minus 2 term is if the a sub minus 2 term is 0. But the important thing is it's a polynomial of degree less than or equal to n minus 2. Then something's important about this last one as well. And the important thing there is it has a zero of order at least capital N. So zero of order greater than or equal to capital N at, let's see, Z naught. So that's just by the fact that that thing's analytic there and then we can pull a Z minus Z naught to the capital N out of that whole thing. Okay, so now from here, we'll take the derivative of both sides. Oh, I just realized I forgot my f of z here. So let's take the derivative of this. So that's going to give me the derivative, well, the n minus first derivative of z minus z naught to the n times f of z equals... So if I take the n minus first derivative of a polynomial of degree less than or equal to n minus 2, I get 0. If I take the n minus first derivative of this, notice I'll get n minus 1 factorial times a sub minus 1. That's because I'll turn this down to a constant, but then I'll have to multiply by n minus 1 times n minus 2 times n minus 3, so on and so forth. And then I'll have that as plus some sort of function that has a 0 at z naught. And we know that we maintain having a 0 at z naught because we're taking n minus 1 derivatives of something that has a 0 of order at least n at z naught. But now if we take the limit as z goes to z naught, this thing is going to disappear and we're going to be left with n minus 1 factorial times a sub minus 1, which is the residue. Solve for a sub minus 1 and we get this formula. Okay, now let's look at some examples. Now that we have some nice techniques for calculating residues, let's look at some examples. So let's start with the residue of the hyperbolic sine of z times e to the z over z cubed at 0. Now that we have nice techniques for finding residues, let's look at some examples. So our first example will be the residue of hyperbolic cosine of z times e to the z over z cubed. So let's notice this is a third order pole. So since this is a third order pole, we want to do 1 over 2 factorial, which is 1 over 3 minus 1 factorial, or 1 over 2. 
and then the limit as z approaches zero of z cubed times this, but notice that just like cancels out the denominator. And then we have the second derivative of the hyperbolic cosine times e to the z. Okay, so something like that. So now let's take that derivative. So that's gonna give us one half, and then we have the limit as z goes to zero of, now we can use like a nice kind of binomial expansion trick for finding the second derivative. So it would be the second derivative of hyperbolic cosine, which is back to hyperbolic cosine times e to the z, plus two times the first derivative of each. That'll be hyperbolic sine of z times e to the z, and then plus the second derivative of the e to the z part times hyperbolic cosine. That'll give me the hyperbolic cosine of z times e to the z. Now from here, we can just plug in z equals zero. We'll notice that the hyperbolic sine of zero is zero, so that goes to zero. Hyperbolic cosine of zero is one. E to the zero is one, so we have one plus one over two. That gives us the number one in the end. All right, let's look at another one. Let's find the residue of one over z times z minus one squared times z plus one at one. So let's observe that that is a second order pole at z equals one. It's a first order pole at z equals zero and z equals negative one. You guys can calculate those residues if you want to. But since it's a second order pole here, that means we need the limit as z goes to one of the derivative of this thing times z minus one squared. That just eliminates the z minus one squared. So we have the derivative of one over z times z minus one. I'll write that as z squared plus z. So now let's take that derivative. So that's gonna give us the limit as z goes to one of, let's see, we'll have two z plus one over z squared plus z squared, and then we need to multiply it by a minus one. That's all because of like the chain rule. Now we can plug in z equals one, and in the end, you'll see that we get negative three quarters. Okay, let's do one more. Let's find the residue of maybe the, the cotangent of z at n times pi. So recall that the cotangent is cosine over sine. Sine is zero at all integer multiples of pi. So these are all simple poles, so we can calculate these all at once. This is gonna be the cosine of z over the derivative of the sine of z evaluated at z equals n times pi. Derivative of sine is cosine, so that gives me the cosine of n times pi over the cosine of n times pi or the number one. Okay, great. So now we're gonna look at the notion of the residue at infinity, do an example of that and then leave you guys with some warm-up problems. So in previous videos, we extended ideas of zeros at complex numbers, as well as poles and singularities at comp complex numbers, to zeros at infinities and singularities at infinity as well. So it makes sense that we would extend the notion to residues at infinity, and this is how we do it. This will be a little bit clear why this is the right definition later. So the residue of f at infinity is negative the residue of 1 over z squared times f of 1 over z at 0. Okay, so let's look at uh, our example. So we want to find the residue of z plus 1 over z squared minus 2z at infinity. So that'll give that'll be negative the residue of 1 over z squared of 1 over z plus 1 over 1 over z squared minus 2 over z at 0. So I've just composed 1 over z into this function. So let's see how that simplifies. That's gonna give us negative the residue of one over z plus one over one minus two z at zero. That's what I get from multiplying the z squared through the denominator. Well, next up, maybe we'll multiply the numerator and the denominator by z. That gives me the residue of, or I should say the negative of the residue of z plus 1 over z minus 2z squared at 0. 
then I can bring this minus sign in and that'll switch this order of subtraction in the denominator. That leaves me with the residue of z plus one over, let's see, I'll have two z squared minus z at zero. Notice that has a simple pole at zero. So since it has a simple pole at zero, we can calculate that pretty easily. This is gonna be equal to z plus one over the derivative of two z squared minus z evaluated at z equals zero. Evaluating z plus one at z equals zero gives us the number one. And then taking this derivative and plugging in one will give us negative one. So our residue in the end is negative one. Okay, let's look at some warmups. So the warmup is fairly straightforward today. It's just calculate some residues. This is really gonna build nicely towards our next video. So the first is to find the residue of 2z over z squared plus nine, both at plus three i and minus three i. Next, we've got the residue of sine of z over z squared at zero. Be careful about what order pole that you have in this case, though. The next is the residue of the tangent of z at all singularities for the tangent of z. Those are all simple poles. It's pretty similar to what was happening with the cotangent. And finally, the residue at infinity of 3z squared plus 1 over z squared minus 4z. And that's a good place to stop.